Hello everyone and welcome to the Adam Josh Oral Brog episode number 61. And this uh, video blog has been about uh, three years in the making, three years coming. And I've debated back, back and forth whether or not to even do this and this is my second attempt at recording it today because I was interrupted for about 20 minutes and uh, had to go a few places. But here I am. And what I wanted to talk about is the blog that I wrote three years ago called On Peter Youngren, which you can find at adamjosh.com in the blog section or the archive section in December 1st, 2009. And I want to say ahead of time that I don't have any personal vendetta against this man or any other sort of uh, preachers, whether they be from uh, whatever religion. You know? So, let's just get right to it. Grab a drink of story time. This is a long time coming. Anyone who knows me will probably agree. To me, what's been done has been done, and normally I wouldn't be bothered to write this out. Then I started dreaming about him, which has had a motivational effect on me. To be perfectly honest, I hope Peter himself reads this. Not that I'll ever get an apology from him, or that he would actually ever be honestly able to feel sorry or get my money back. Recently I asked in a public forum, or said in a public forum, I want my money back. Yeah, I won't be getting that back either, I wouldn't expect. If you're unaware who Peter Youngren is, here's a brief summary. His websites include peteryoungren.org, the Christian Channel, Celebration, Celebration Church, churches.org. There's more which should least of all tip you off to just how prolific the man is. He comes from a family dynasty of preachers. And then I link to, uh, an episode where uh, it was on Grace TV where he has his uncle and, or his brother or some, his family's there. At his, uh, at, the, at the Bible college that I went to, his brother and his uh, son were also teachers there. His parents were teachers, his brothers are preachers, his uncles are preachers, his kids are preachers, and his friends are preachers. It seems no matter what he does, good or bad, this will never change. It's the Youngren family legacy. It sounds like the Mafia to me. I've had a few dreams about him. Here's one I wrote about a while back, and then I clicked the link. I, in the previous version I recorded this, I read it, but I'm not going to bother going to read everything, all the links here. I had a dream about him the night before last I never wrote down. In the dream, he was on a platform preaching to people, and I was sitting down near the front eating something like a sub. He had people lined up to be prayed for, and in the dream he was saying that he was going to heal them, which I took offense to. You are going to heal them, I said. Yes, me, I'm going to heal these people. God is giving me healing power. Can't you heal people? To which I said, no, I can't heal people, not in the way you're referring to. And then he uh, apologized later. Look, I'm sorry. I was just caught up in the moment. Of course, I can't uh, heal people. I have no healing power myself. I told him I forgave him, and that's about where I woke up. Or maybe he has been on my mind lately because he recently acquired a Christian television station that rebranded at Grace TV, setting up a studio downtown St. Catharines on St. Paul Street in the old Royal Bank of Canada headquarters. Insert pun here. Of course, me having connections that I do, have heard of this and many other of, as his, of his endeavors. But I digress. Why don't I take you back in time to my first memories of Peter, seeing as how I am dedicating my time, my thoughts, and this web space to him today. So because of this blog that, I've that I wrote a while ago, and because of other forums online, like Benedic Benediction Blog, <laughs> Benediction Blogs On, and uh, there's some other forums that I've posted my thoughts on, because of that, I've sort of become one of a f one of many voices that are critiquing uh, his ministry. And because I don't have any vendetta against him, I'm sort of sometimes I'll post, sometimes I won't. Sometimes I'll say things, sometimes I don't. Until it, usually it's when I realize that it's sort of seeming like I'm out to get this guy. That's usually when I stop. Because I'm not. I just figured, well, people can tell stories, and I'm going to tell my story of. Uh, my experience with this guy. So this is my dad took me to one of his uh, first meet. First, uh, first time I ever went was one of his meetings that he was in. Uh, I think Queen Mary School, and then there was another one when they first opened up the building 
uh, that later became Word of Life, that later became Niagara Celebration Church. And uh, so I can, I'm telling my story from sort of a first-hand point of view in the way I see it. So my first memory of the man is going to one of his meetings, which was being held in Queen Mary School, coincidentally where my first gig was, way before he ever owned a building, let alone a TV station. It had to be eight or nine, maybe even younger. My dad was taking me and my brother there. Side, side note, my dad was a divorcee at the time and could relate to Peter on that level. Uh, my dad used to tell me that he liked Peter Youngren because he knew what it was like to be a single dad raising children. Peter has lots of children. During Bible school, which I'll get to later, Peter didn't hide the fact that the wife he was married to at the time wasn't his first wife, and he would sometimes tell stories about his previous wife. Like uh, When I was in the Bible college in 2001 and 2, Peter uh, himself taught a lot of classes and would tell stories in between lessons and all that, and people would ask questions, and, and he'd answer as candidly as he could to a room full of young students. <clears throat> What's more, I spent several hours with his wife at the time in marriage counseling, a very graceful and intelligent woman. Uh, yeah, right before I got married, and then while I, right during, well, after my, my marriage, uh, I was in counseling with his wife, like both my wife and I were in counseling with Peter's wife at the time, and it was like a weekly thing that we'd go and we'd pray together and and talk about what was up in our relationships. And usually it was always bad for us because you know it didn't last more than a year. Well, yeah, it lasted a year and a bit. We ended up getting divorced before our second anniversary. Totally other subject. Um, and I've been single ever since. So, back to my first time seeing Peter. We went to other meetings which may have been held in other places, but there's one in particular that I, may, I remember that my dad and my brother and brought me to so we could pray for uh, my brother's healing. I remember being in a circle around Jamie and, and Peter praying that the Lord would heal him from autism. I also remember leaving sort of angry and let down that he didn't. Time changes things, I cannot, and I can honestly say that I never really held the lack of my brother's healing against Peter for very long. So don't get me wrong, it's not my intention to have this article be about the phony healings of evangelical preachers. That's a whole other subject. I suppose my next memory of Peter would have to be when, after getting my own apartment, I started reading the Bible and talking to God. I was about 17, 18 years old, and I was really getting into religious literature, daily prayer, and trying to see how spirituality could fit into my everyday life. One day I came across a verse in Hebrews which read, Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful, and let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembly of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so much more as you see the day approaching. Uh, Hebrews 10, chapter 10, verse 23 and 25. 23 to 25. Of course I took that to be the Lord speaking directly to me to go find a church. In hindsight, I can realize now that the writer of Hebrews wasn't referring to weekly church att attendance, especially on a Sunday, but the three major Israeli feasts outlined in the Torah that require observers to gather uh, together at the temple in Jerusalem, as of Exodus 23, verse 14 and 17. Minor mistake, right? Regardless, the Word of Life church, church was pretty close to my apartment and I had been hearing about all the religious crazies that go there, so I figured I'd go check it out. That couldn't hurt. I'm not sure if I knew prior to my going there, but Peter Youngren was the pastor there at Word of Life, rebranded later to NCC, Niagara Celebration Church. I can safely say Peter is a big fan of rebranding. My weekly church attendance eventually turned into an interest in Peter's World Impact Bible Institute, later rebranded to Celebration Bible College. I shelled out the first year's fee, something around $3,500 out of my savings at the time, and there I was, a paying student of the Bible. I'm skipping a lot of bunny trails and side stories here, but for the short version I'd like to stick to this, the things that relate to Peter himself. During the first year, Peter taught a few classes himself, like missions and leadership. Most students, including myself, saw slash see this as a great opportunity to get close to the man and ask the tough questions. He would encourage students before the break to write out their questions on a piece of paper and leave them on his desk, which was a pulpit. I was the one who asked, 
Have you ever raised the dead? Just in case you were wondering who that was, by the way. Also, when Peter poked fun at Islam, saying that it was originally spread by the sword, I was the one who said the, the Crusades were incomparably worse. I spent a year studying Islam at the local masjid and have many Muslim friends. And still do. And uh, still have continued to study Islam. After my completion of first year, I was awarded a nice little plaque and a now totally useless certificate in Christian leadership. I say useless because as, as a result of a few behind the scenes type things happening, you can't really transfer that certificate nowadays to any school other than the ones he invented. This brings me my story to second year, the year I was kicked out by Peter himself. Every second year student has to write and perform a second year preach, about 20 minutes in length. I had gone through some pretty severe changes in my faith due to my honest question asking and research over the course of the summer. I would learned, among other things, that the truth is, Jesus' name wasn't Jesus, nor did he ever hear anyone call him that 2,000 years ago. I had learned that the truth was, the Lord's name isn't Jehovah, the Ten Commandments aren't evil, obeying the commandments, the first five books of the Bible, the Torah, isn't the devil, tithing to a pastor as is done today isn't found anywhere in the Bible, the Sabbath isn't Sunday, the Messiah didn't come 2,000 years ago to destroy the law, the biblical feasts were never done away with, pork was never pronounced clean, and that being saved isn't the end of obedience. That repentance doesn't mean to continue in sin and love the Lord. And that most of all, grace isn't a license to continue on sinning. Sin being breaking the commandments or doing something you know to be wrong. Learning all these things, of course, put me on a slightly different path coming into second year as compared to my classmates. I was focused on the Messiah, who I was calling at the time Rabbi Yahusha or Yahushua. I was focused on learning uh, Hebrew and how his name would have been said and pronounced and so far away from uh, where we are today I think every sort of Christian knows that but you know they say his name is the name above all names but then we'll call him what everybody else calls him for you know because nobody wants to be different or in a cult so I was focused on Rabbi Yahusha who he, who he really was what he really ate what he really taught. I was amazed that my interest in doing what the Savior did was seen as legalism. I had fallen from grace because I wanted to live like the Messiah. Apparently it was self-righteous of me to want to know the truth. I cared about my Savior's name since it was taught to me to be above all names. I cared about what he ate, what day he rested, what holidays he, excuse me, what holidays he celebrated, seeing as this is my Lord and Savior, the Prince, the Messiah, the King of Kings. The Lord of Lords. I wondered what would Yahusha do and applied that question to reality, not some rose-colored Christian hindsight glasses. Would he have eaten pork? No. Would he slave away working for minimum wage on the Sabbath? No. Would he celebrate Halloween? No. Christmas? Easter? No. And should I imitate the one who I call Master? As the often quoted Paul said, be imitators of me even as I so uh, am of Messiah. Or, now I mean this, each one of you says, I follow Paul, I follow Apollos, I follow Kepha, I follow Messiah. Is the Messiah divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you immersed into the name of Paul? 1 Corinthians. To me, this knowledge was elemental at the time. Others apparently disagreed. I must have been crazy, right? My second year preach was something like the New Covenant, the most important thing you'll learn in Bible school. Which, in hindsight, I can admit may have been a silly and inflammatory title to call a 20 minute preach. To my past self events, I packed a ton of information into something I called information packages and attempted to put each one in a stu the student's mail slots, but was shortly thereafter kiboshed by Tamara Heeslip and her minion, which I had a very, very difficult time getting over. It was a weird day, but while I was, I remember while I was preaching, I had asked my wife to go put all this information that I had photocopied at uh, Staples or whatever in, uh, in everybody's mail slot because there was a public mail slot where you could put your mail. So I was publicly doing this, putting them in people's public mail slots. And uh, as I was preaching, uh, I guess uh, Tamara, I don't know if she was the dean or dean's assistant or something at the time, but she was going and getting her assistant to take, take them out. And I mean, I had paid for that stuff. Uh, out of my pocket and uh, it had a lot of good information in it I thought uh, like a brief study of the names uh, of the Sabbath of 
dispensationalism, I remember. A few people still have them that I keep in touch with. I keep held on to that. So, I've seen it a while ago. Anyway, needless to say, I was unaware at the time of my preach that Mr. Youngren was going through some pretty personal family struggles due to his seemingly unrepentant ability to remain faithful to one woman. He later publicly confessed the truth of the scandalous situation during a Sunday service and stepped down from certain aspects of his ministry for a short period of time. During my preach, I covered the Ten Commandments, including you shall not commit adultery, and how they were good and still should be followed, along with others, along with four others that were established as wholesome, encouraging, and the book of Acts. In the book of Acts, we read in chapter 15, verse 29, Instead, we should write to them, telling them to abstain from food polluted by idols, from sexual immorality, from the meat of strangled animals, and from blood. So I radically changed my diet at that time. And anybody knows me that uh, I've still been eating the same way that I do that. I barely eat meat anymore, actually. If I do, it's usually salmon. But uh, since then, I've been eating what you would call a kosher diet. So that's been going on about 10 years now. And I'm so used to it that I don't even actually ever think about it until I'm around somebody who doesn't know or until I'm around somebody that uh, doesn't eat the way I do. I'm well aware now that if I wanted to remain a student of that Bible school because of the sensitive atmosphere at the time, I probably should have went with the Lord's love and how awesome it is. My bad. Long story short, I never had my information packages returned to me. Is that Christian stealing? Which I thought was a complete lack, complete waste of $50 worth of paper and copying. And I was promptly kicked out of the school by a letter from the president himself, Peter Younger. And I was told my presence was no longer welcome, that my sowing seeds of discord wasn't to be tolerated anymore, and that my account was in arrears, and that's that. Thanks for coming out. A few days later, I was told that Peter referred to me as a cancer in front of my can classmates, a cancer that would be better burned off quickly before I spread and do more damage. How thoughtful of him. It's not all bad news, though. I wrote a few songs about the whole experience, one being running away from the church. Did I mention that I was also fired from his telephone ministry? I had a job working part-time on the phones there. Um, I was the guy who'd call you if you donated anything or if you wrote your number down or anything. I'd be the one to call you and thank you for your partnership. I'd tell you that I would be glad to pray with you about anything you want. And lastly, I'd remind you of the great things Peter is doing overseas with World Impact Ministries and that you could support with a financial gift or check or visa by phone. During some of my downtime, I would browse through unedited video of missions overseas. One time I saw him raking an audience, uh, something I thought was extremely odd, something I hadn't seen before, something I wasn't aware he did to penny penniless African people who traveled in some case days to see him preach. All this change of attitude I was going through reflected poorly on my work there and eventually resulted in my being let go as my co collection numbers dwindled and my team spirit sputtered out. Not before a few nice lunches at his house, hosted by him and his wife though, those were great and very much appreciated. I was running away from church. Speaking of food, while I was attending the Bible school I was also handing out bags of assorted groceries to less fortunate people after the Sunday services. I enjoyed that very much. So much so that I actually volunteered several times to actually sort and bag the assorted groceries themselves back at a warehouse rented out by the ministry, also in St. Catharines. While doing so, I discovered that because of the church's nonprofit status, they were on the reception end of a government-run system that collects drops and dented goods from supermarkets around the area to then be delivered to and distributed from a hub warehouse in Toronto. Of course, no one at Sunday service probably knew this, and not that it prevented them from giving money to help feed the homeless, as Peter would explain from the pulpit. It's not like the less fortunate people cared where they got their free food from, no matter what the pastor was telling his flock. Maybe it's changed since then. Maybe you never, maybe he never knew he was fibbing. Who knows? Also, for a short time, I played bongos for the church band. You could probably see some old videos and see me up there in the back banging my heart out. Uh, I was there for a few major services like when Ted Shuttlesworth came to speak and he he got he, he got me off stage and he kind of took me aside and said uh, tell me about your family you know and he was praying and prophesying that my mom and dad would get back together it was really strange my mom and dad have been divorced since I was eight and uh, live in separate ends of the country they're not getting back together and, and it hasn't happened by the date that uh, he said he would 
nothing against Ted Charlesworth. I thought he was an interesting guy to listen to. <coughs> I like lots of crazy people, and I have lots of crazy friends. Suffice it to say, I know who I am talking about when I talk about Peter Younger, and I'm sure he remembers me. He probably denies that he remembers me nowadays, but because of all this, but whatever. He knows who I am. I haven't spent a whole lot of time thinking about Peter or his ministry since then, but that was back in 2002, I believe. Over the years, I've had the occasional update from old friends saying, did you hear Pastor so-and-so left, or did you hear he's going through with the divorce? And did you hear the Bible college was renamed and now has like five students? Also, I still have some old friends who stayed the course and are now overseas, part of something Peter called Celebrate Jesus International. At the time, who knows if it's been rebranded since then. Of course, there was a part of me that felt sort of vindicated to hear of his apparent failures, but the better part of me just felt sorry for all those well-meaning people who ended up being misled and at best being taught half-truths, even if they were some of the most accurate half-truths being taught out there in the Christian world. Let me be clear, I honestly don't have any issue with Peter Youngren today. It may not sound that way as you read this, but what you're hearing is a result of a one-way conflict. I was never able to see Peter face to face after I was kicked out. I didn't get my money back, and I had to appeal to him through letters, which I did, which obviously didn't get me anywhere. In fact, as a previous blog states, I have been praying for him for several months now. Not only that, but I've, in, I've entered his Win a Trip to Israel contest, and I'm now in receipt of two letters and a book from his ministry. There's so many other problems in life, I really do wish him and his family all the best. Today, after waking up thinking about that last dream I had about him, though, I googled him and came up with some startling information. And then I list a whole bunch of stuff that I found online, which you could do as well if you typed in uh, Peter Younger and divorce, Peter Younger and adultery. You could find tons of stuff, and this is the stuff that he's been responding to lately on his website called the cesspool of online Christian mudslinging or whatever he called it. So after reading all that, I was sort of like, there was some stuff that I didn't know. I still sort of thought like, oh, whatever, what's done is done. He wants to live in his make-believe, imaginary Jesus land, that's fine. Whatever makes makes money and whatever, you know, he thinks he's doing the, maybe the right thing. Obviously, he's been doing it for years, so whatever. Who am I to argue? And uh, he can do whatever he wants to do. And he does, and it doesn't seem like anybody can stop him. <laughs> so I had, nothing, I had nothing against him. So I was just taken back by all this other extra stuff that I found and I wrote, yikes, it appears the man will have his hands full for the conceivable future. I guess the question would be, just because Peter makes mistakes, should that stop him from winning souls for Jesus? Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob had multiple wives. Solomon had lots of wives, as did his father David, so it can't be wrong, right? We commoners just don't understand the Bible like we should, right? I'll leave that up for you to decide. Also, I paid around $4,000 to hear his teaching, and then on top of that, I tithed regularly at the church he was a pastor at, and so don't think I don't agree with a lot of his teaching or that I don't enjoy the simple message of the gospel he delivers. His biography states, Peter Youngren received the call to world evangelism at the age of 15. Still a teenager, he began preaching in small chapels and mission houses. Maybe like the late, late Michael Jackson, Peter entered into all this at such a prepubescent, prepubescent age that he has yet to outgrow Neverland. Maybe he never will. Who's to say? As a musician, I'm aware of the dangerous realities that accompany being only surrounded by yes men and women. On top of all that, looking at uh, the ministry financials that I did recently, the, I mean, we're talking mil, mil, multi-millions, 30 million since 2001 for World Impact Ministries. This is a multi-million dollar operation. So don't think that doesn't attract yes, yes men and yes women, people who see the man as a, a way to get their bills paid, you know? In conclusion, I'm of the opinion when it comes to any leaders of any faith, check them out for yourself, make sure you're aware who you're looking up to. And then I link to this CNN story about, uh, check it out for yourself, it's so disturbing, I can't even talk about it. I can say that um, it's a family who is uh, who are all preachers running an incestual bestiality ring, basically. Really, really disturbing. So... I mean, people look up to them as pastors, right? So you're looking up to these people and, and looking to them for spiritual authority and they're into incest and bestiality and killing people and burying them on their farmland. So I'm just saying, maybe if you knew something about these people who are looking up to you and you knew that information, you'd say, well, 
they're preaching a good preach and talking a good talk, but they're not walking the walk. So maybe, as a believer who, who's option and free to go, has the option to free and free will to go anywhere, maybe I'll go elsewhere. Maybe I don't really want to give my money and support a ministry where the leader guy is, uh, you know, having incestual sex with his family and uh, bestiality and uh, burying people in his backyard after he murders them. Maybe, maybe I want to go somewhere else. So. I would say make sure who you're aware of who you're looking up to, who you're allowing into your life, and who are you, who you are allowing to teach you spiritual things. Well, that is unless you want to have their same problems in your own life, unless you have the ability only to listen to the message and not be affected by the behavior of the speaker. But if that were the case, why go to church or Bible college at all when you can simply study the Bible yourself at no charge? In the words of the Messiah's brother in the book of James, let not many of you become teachers, my brothers, knowing that we will receive heavier judgment, for in many things we all stumble. If anyone doesn't stumble in word, the same as the perfect man, able to bridle his whole body also. Some people, not particularly myself, may be inclined to, inclined to quote this passage in Timothy. This is a true saying that if a man desires the office of a bis bishop, he desires a good work. The bishop must be blameless, the husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality, able to teach, not given to wine, no striker, not greedy, of filthy uh, money, patient, not a brawler, not covetous, one that rules his own house, having children in subjection with all gravity, for if a man doesn't know how to rule his own house, how can he take care of the church of God? Not a novice, lest being lifted up with pride shall fall into the condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he, moreover, he must have a good report of them which are without, lest he fall into, into reproach and the snare of the devil. First Timothy. But I'm more inclined to go at this passage. Blessed are those who do his commandments, that they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter through the gates of the city. But outside are dogs, sorcerers, and sexually immoral, and murderers, and adulterers, and whoever loves and practices a lie. Revelations 22, verse 14 and 15. Why any pastor or teacher would want to practice a lie is beyond me. But that doesn't stop it from happening. Compromising breeds corruption. The city of New Jerusalem, what is referred to as heaven, is a real place and there's no Christian gate to get into it. So lucky, good luck trying to get past the angels with your lawless religion. And then I quote uh, Revelation 21, chapter 12 and 14 and talk about uh, the names of the 12 tribes of Israel on the gates. And there's no like main gate that says, okay, here's the Christian section, and here's the Jewish section, and here's the Islamic section. Also, Paul wasn't one of the 12 apostles, whether he thinks he was or not. Read the first chapter of Acts, the 11 apostles replaced Judas, Yehuda, right away, and his replacement wasn't named Paul. You want a book of Acts church? Yeah, right. A book I recommend to Mr. Younger and all aspiring pastors, evangelists, deacons, elders, and all those who seek after truth is Fossilized Customs by Lou White. Here's another link if that one decided to stop working. I've read it four or five times, and I'm reading it again right now. It sh shatters the culture of lies that we stand on, leaving only the foundation of truth. If you can handle it, do not be deceived. Signs and wonders do not make a compromised teaching 100% true. If this is all a preacher can rely on to convince you, run fast. Do not, I repeat, do not open up your wallets to these types. I don't know about Mr. Youngren, but I never want to hear this from my Savior. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. And that day many may say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name? Did we not do mighty wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness, of Torahlessness. People who, there's preachers who teach people that it's, you know, it's okay to not obey. We're, on, you, you know, we're under grace now. You don't have to obey anything. Sounds a lot like the devil. Devil, you know, in the Garden of Eden in Genesis chapter 3, is, t is tricking people. You don't have to obey him. Don't obey him. You're not going to die. Don't worry about it. We're under grace now. They called him Lord. They didn't know his name. They didn't obey Torah, all while casting out demons and doing many mighty works. Who does that sound like to you? In Peter's defense, he knows and understands the name Yeshua, but thinks it's only to be used with Jews only, which sort of makes you wonder if he knows that names aren't to be translated but trans transliterated that or he doesn't really believe Yahushua HaMashiach is a real person but a thing a way to make money there's just something about that name alright it's not his name unless you're trying to say hail Zeus Greco-Roman nouns ending with, with S-U-S or S-word to honor their highest deity Zeus Tarsus means the sweat of Zeus F is Zeus etc etc 
My name is Adam, whether I'm in China, Russia, Greece, or Mexico. How about we call Peter Pebblesey's preacher from now on? He does like rebranding, after all. I mean, Kifa was questionably translated as rock, not cub or young lion. In Hebrew, then to Petra or Petros in Greek, Latin. Love that S ending, then to Peter in English, but I like calling stones pebbles, so I think I'll just change his name to Pebble Zeus. Keeping Zeus as the ending, of course, and then I'll throw in his title at the end. Pebble Zeus Preacher. Compromising breeds corruption. But none of this will matter to you if you've disregarded the first and second commandments, or if you don't have the law written on your heart, which is one of the definitions of the new covenant. The message of the misused and misunderstood word gospel has always been and always will be repent for the reign of Yahuwah draws near. So repent, all of us, while we still can. The truth will set you free. So, and then uh, let's get to the updates at the top here, and then I'll give my final thoughts. Uh, starting with the first updates. My first update of this blog was on uh, the 23rd of February 2010. And I wrote, I get a lot of flack for this blog I wrote last year. The gist of the flack being, I'm the one that needs to be silenced. I caused all these problems. What's more, I haven't known Peter since I was nine. I shouldn't have an opinion. I'm clueless. I only want to hurt his family and those who work with him and that are trying to distance themselves from him. Got it. If you want to see the truth of the matter, just continue reading. That was my point all along, to only tell what I factually knew from my viewpoint. Of course, I could have opined a great deal, seeing as how I knew and worked with most of the players in this sort of drama. But did I? Read on and find out for yourself. Surely if Peter can call out Pat Robinson on national television about his comments regarding Haiti, saying they are pathetic and don't represent the views of Grace TV, I can tell a first-person story about my dealings over a 20-year-long period with Peter Younger and put it on my personal blog. Wouldn't you agree? I mean, I was writing this on my website. I'm not like, it's my website. I can write whatever I want on my website. So I got nasty emails from people that were related, people that were worked for him and said like, you know, we're, some people say, well, like, we're trying to distance ourselves from him and, you know, you, you saying our names isn't helping, blah, blah, blah. And we're trying to put this all behind us. So uh, I did edit some of my, some, edit some of my stuff out and edit some details out. Also, let me say, I'm not afraid of Peter Younger or any other mountain circle or, or whoever he could pay to come after me. If I was, I wouldn't have called him out on his lawless theology in his own church in 2001. Who's in the business of tricking people not to obey the word of the Lord? And then I repeat what I said earlier. As far back as Genesis chapter 3, we find the serpent, the enemy of your soul, in the garden saying, you surely won't die. That's what Peter's been preaching his whole career. You don't have to obey. Good news. And if you disobey, you won't die. Same old trick. Thousands of years old. And it's like, look, I'm being proven right by the size of my ministry. My ministry keeps expanding. I keep duping people. So look, I mean, the evidence that I'm right is in my ministry. The evidence that what I'm saying is true is in these healings that have, you know, no documented proof. It's in these healings and it's in all these people that are getting saved. Are they saved? I don't know. If you say they're saved, are they saved? You tell me. But I get it. This is just a game. And it doesn't matter if a preacher lies to people year after year. It doesn't matter if a preacher withholds information from his flock. This is all just fun and games, and we shouldn't ever get mad about a lying preacher. It's time to back off, time to mince words, and it's time to let another 20 years go by with the sleeping masses have their ears itched and backs fleeced. Well, you can all sleep. I'm awake, I'm not part of the Peter Younger flock, and just like Paul who cried over what he knew would happen to the flock after he left, I'm mad, I'm sick of it, I don't want to take it anymore. I don't want to just talk about standing up for truth, this isn't about me, it's, the, it's about the people that are being hurt by this scandalous wolf, about the ruined lives, about the countless failed marriages that came out from Peter's ministry, most of whom, some of whom I know, personally. About people who look to him for leadership, who thirsting for truth instead get a mouthful of sand for the well-meaning deceived masses and for the sheep of Yahuwah or who are being called out. It's time to account for the damage done about them, for the money sown. So take action, stand up, truth is truth, preach the truth, not lies, not compromisers. compromises. You cowards and man-pleasers can say whatever you want, but your time has come. It's time to find out who it is you've been talking about all these years and how powerful he really is. And obviously using his word is a double-edged sword, so I too am looking at my own foundation and re-examining my foundation as well. I suggest we all do the same. And then I give a brief blurb from Richard Shimtero. Peter Youngman was after, asked to leave the Open Bible Faith Fellowship four years ago by myself. His credentials were pulled at that time and he will not be reinstated into the fellowship. Taken from benedictionblogson.com and uh, the link's there. 
Also, I might as well show you some technical information. People at Peter Youngren's ministry have been frequenting this site since I wrote my expose on their Mac Daddy. Maybe they don't realize that I have their IP address and I show that uh, people have been visiting my website from his ministry because they leave their IP address behind. It clearly says peteryoungren.org or World Impact Ministries. Um, update 2502-2010. I had a dream last night that I was at the Toronto Celebration Church standing outside. The people were coming out of the service just walking out of the doors. Peter had a white short sleeve shirt on. It was nice out and he was following them out trying to preach to them, trying to keep them from leaving. There were other ministers, worship leaders, and pastors standing at the front with microphones trying to talk to the people to get to them to stay. The police were there off in the distance as well. I mentioned to Peter, it looks like they're coming out party to which he thought I was making a sexual joke, which I wasn't. Instead of explaining myself, I went and greeted a few faces I knew as the people scattered away. Update 1304-2010. Uh, finally, someone at Christian Week group here and wrote an expose on this businessman and actually got real interviews. And there's an article in Christian, Christian Week about him. Next update, uh, 2604-2010. EKM Ministries Finnish, Finland has filed a report with Finnish police and is pressing charges against Jongren. Click here for details. Update 0305-2010. Peter is now being forced to respond to these factual accusations being made against him by his own peers. My opinion is that for him it all boils down to, I own it, I am the driving force, so I can do what I want with it. He does what he wants, period. Click here for details, for actual letters, for names, and for dates. Update 1611-2010. Peter Younger fights with the Swedish Christian media. You can click the link and see for that. Um... Uh, let's skip to update 1908-2011. There are rumors that Peter is engaged now to this Tana Kusitaluma that would make it wife number three for anyone counting official wives. I'll confirm when I get a proper source, but I mention it because people I believe told me it's common knowledge in parts of Sweden where they're both from. You can click the link that I gave to look for that. Uh, update 01-09-2011. Peter responds, and so do I. Click here to see the latest. And then uh, the last update, uh, which I wrote today, was here's an overview of World Impact Ministries' public financials. And it reveals some startling information for his partners that they may not know. And here's some information about the current gift scam that's running on Grace TV. Uh, Peter's response... That uh, he wrote on his website, which we can check out quick. Uh, the internet has become a haven for anonymous liars who operate without accountability. The lies about myself or church and ministries are too many to itemize. The list would dignify that which is incoherently evil. Granted, a few statements are by people who probably have good intentions but they are just as ignorant and untrue nevertheless. Um, clearly anybody who's reading this would, would see right away that he's using the internet, spamming people, sending this to everybody on his Facebook list, everybody in his ministry can read this, every, all his partners, sending this to everybody, and then criticizing the internet liars, saying, and then he's not backing up in, any information, he's not tackling any of the topics that these internet liars uh, brought up, he's just blanket statementing, state, stating that all these are internet liars, and they're all ignorant and untrue. Others make serious lies, which rise to the level of defamation. Okay, I don't understand what the point of saying the word defamation is. So what are you going to do? You're going to take any of these people to court for defamation because you're not, because you'll see that. The, um, the things that people are bringing up, for the most part that I know of, are a matter of public record and public information and public knowledge. So what's defamation about that? Plus, as far as I know, Peter isn't that litigious. The worst lies are half-truths. Facts are twisted and motivations are imagined. I do not know who the people are that attack our ministry, which is probably a lie. Some deceptively pretend to be current or past staff members. I mean, I'm not pretending. I don't know who else is out there. Um, I am a past staff member. I mean, he has the records to prove it, and so do I. Others engage in conversations with themselves, making an entry under one name, only to comment on their own entry under a different name, making their 
making it seem there is a big interest in their ideas. Blatant lies by anonymous writers can go unchallenged for years. Which is really funny because if you go to his website, peteryoungren.org, and you type in a comment, it'll be in moderation, right? If, especially if it's negative. But the nameless comments are just one na one title comments are all encouraging. You know, Joe in Montana says, yeah, great job, Peter. Sue in Halifax says, great job, Peter. We're totally with you. All in the same sort of uh, type font and same sort of uh, vernacular. So, you know, who is the challenge? I, I, would, I would say that uh, it's pretty clear to me that he's doing the he's doing the same thing that he's accusing of. This whole entry that he's done on his website is doing the same thing that he's accusing other people of. And instead of taking it the other way, like the Messiah on the cross, as people are hurling insults at him, he takes it and asks God forgive them. He like it's almost impossible for Peter to take the high road in this in this case, which is sad. It's truly sad. Because people who are giving him money and, and uh, who are partnered with him expect more. I know that. I know they do. Anyway, he uh, backwardsly interprets uh, some scriptures about uh, Shammai taunting David, which is totally a wrong interpretation of that biblical story. I don't know how he could pervert the scriptures like that and interpret that story that way, but whatever. Uh, the only exception of the above mentioned anonymity is a pastor of a small church, so he's saying the only above anonymity I'm not being anonymous, so and I'm not a pastor of a small church, so he's not a, including me in his letter, I guess. I have many faults and failures, just like everyone else. Okay, well, tell tell somebody about them. What are your faults and failures? You know, because you're on a TV station, because you're taking in multi-million dollars uh, a year, or in a 10-year period, 30 million dollars, uh, you're being trusted with all this. I think you're sort of at a different level. Um, of trust. You need to tell people who are trusting in you uh, your faults and failures so they know whether or not to uh, give you, continue giving you money. Uh, continue trusting in you to that you're good soil. You're just saying, I have many faults and failures. Well, everybody does. And you know that this is why he was saying, well, I have many faults and failures. Well, I'm reading this. I identify with you. Okay, I have many faults and failures too, just like everyone else, which is his next sentence. I'm just like you, man including a great hero of the Bible, and now he's saying he's a great hero of the Bible and of church history, which is great. Anyway, lying spirits, blah, 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 ringleader, blah, 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 he compares himself to everybody else, blah, 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 the Bible, ending with, meanwhile, Grace Television is reaching people in the next nine weeks, we have three medical gospel campaigns that will reach hundreds of thousands with the gospel. All, every word of that could be uh, debated. Uh, nine weeks are having three mega fe festivals. Are, are they having three mega festivals? Because I don't know. I've, I've been told that uh, the local churches around the area will help bring in whoever they can. And a lot of the times these festivals are made up of mostly Christians. And while he's there, he asks for donations from the crowd, which most people don't know. Where do those donations go? And as far as reaching people with the gospel, what is the gospel? I mean, the gospel, according to Peter Youngren, is uh, completely different than what you see... Uh, R repent for the reign of Yahuwah is at hand or re repent that doesn't seem to be the gospel that he preaches the gospel he preaches is a little bit different grace unto you in the name of some Mexican farmer anyway we could go on and on and on one of the updates that I listed uh, today was Uh, some financials, uh, but uh, you can see that for yourself actually if you click on uh, the update from today. Uh, you can see the various scams that he's running for money. Anyway, I mean all that to say that I don't have a personal vendetta against the man although it may not sound like that. Um, he can do whatever he wants. The truth is is that uh, World Impact Ministries and the man Peter Younger and, uh, is really nothing without his supporters, without the people that give him money. So I'm, I'm more concerned about the people, the little old, little old well-meaning ladies that uh, shell out their 
their savings and all that while avoiding their local churches or their local families or their friends and families who are struggling in this financial crisis and in turn give their uh, money to uh, this type of person. So be aware, I would say, who you're giving money to and uh, I think there's people in your family and in your local congregations who could uh, use a lot, money a lot more than a multi-million dollar ministry. But uh, that's me. I mean, you may think differently. Uh -huh. We could talk about, is Peter qualified to be in the position he's in? Is he biblically qualified to do what he's doing? Uh, it depends of what your interpretation of the Bible is or what your interpretation of leadership is. I mean, uh, Paul in the Bible, you know, in the New Testament and Acts and the writer of so much of the Gospels was a Jewish person who learned in the Torah, who studied in uh, Hebrew and studied Torah just as uh, the Messiah was learned in Torah and studied and went to uh, synagogues and went to temple and all that. Now, uh, to get from all that uh, and had a bloodline relations to, you know, Peter, I'm sorry, uh, the Messiah had like a bloodline lineage relation to uh, the high priest class. So to get from that to bacon eating, baby Jesus loving, grace, do whatever you want and just love Jesus, to get from that to Gentiles being the leaders of this so called Christian movement is so far away from where it all started that I think it's pretty clear for anybody to see that we're miles away. Christianity is miles away from where it started. And uh, that's sort of a sad truth. There's people that want to get back to the Bible, get back to the, you know, the truth, uh, get back to the early apostle days. And uh, that's what uh, attracted me to Peter Youngren's teaching at the beginning was his hunger uh, and passion for the person of the, of the Messiah at the time and from what I thought was a hunger to get back to the truth of the Bible. But then when I revealed the truths that I had found in my, in my independent study, it was like, well, th these aren't accepted. These truths aren't, these aren't our truths. So what, what started off to be claiming was a non-denominational Bible school pretty quickly turned into a denominational Bible school of Peter Youngrenism. And people accused the churchgoers back then of being in a cult, and I never saw it for that when I was there. I just saw it as I'm going to hear teaching from the Bible, and that's cool. And I still like hearing, I go on YouTube and hear teaching from imams and, and biblical scholars and scientists and worldly scholars, you know? Because that's where my mind is at. That's what I'm interested in. And, but uh, when you find out the truth of things and confront people with the truth, if they're not of the truth and they don't want to convert their beliefs to the truth, then uh, you sort of have a conflict. And some people want to go along with the lie because it makes more money, you know? And that's sort of where it seems to be right now. And uh, Peter has left a, a big wake of destruction in his path. And he probably doesn't acknowledge it or even care about it. I don't know. But I know that when he said the words, I do, till death to his part, to his first wife, uh, what does his, his wife think his word is worth right now? Or what does his second wife think his word is worth right now? Is Can Peter Youngren be trusted on anything he says? Three, three wives, two out of three wives agree that his word can't be trusted. And uh, the people he's alienated and and uh, people that he's left hurt and, and uh, the, the massive amounts of damage that he's done. If he can't be trusted in his word to his wives or to his family, what makes you think somebody he doesn't even know who's giving him money, he's going to be honest with you about anything? That's all that being said, like I said, I don't really have a vendetta against him personally. I don't like, I don't like when people are lied to. I don't like seeing little old ladies and well-meaning people 
be deceived, especially when it comes to matters of faith and the truth. But what comforts me is that I have people that I look up to and they tell me, Adam, when that little old lady who means well is giving Peter her last dollar or whatever, giving her donations to him, you have to understand that God, whatever you want to consider God, a higher power or creator of the universe, the all-seeing everything, the all-encompassing all, he sees her heart and where her heart's at. And he also sees people like Peter Younger's heart, which is a lot more, uh, should have a lot more accountability on it. And, uh, but I guess people like Peter Younger can just sort of have live with that. I don't know. But, uh, People are are starting to find out the truth about Peter Youngren and his ministries and his various endeavors. And uh, one by one, people will start stop uh, sewing into his ministry and stop supporting what he does. Uh, but do I ever think he'll stop doing what he does? No. Do I? Would I want him to stop? I don't know. I, I think that as long as if people if people don't go to go to a church that he's at then there's, nothing, there's nobody to preach to. If people don't give him money, there's nothing that he can do. That's a clear sign that, you know, unless he wants to start going on his own funds around the world, uh, which he, I guess he started off doing, you know, it can't go on for too much longer after that. So it's up to the people who believe in him or want to be lied to year after year. It's up to them to sow their money in the proper places and... Uh, attend churches that preach the truth and the truth only. So if the truth is that uh, the Messiah's name isn't Jesus and he never heard that name, then uh, preach that truth. And it is the truth. That's the bottom line. Everybody knows that's the truth. Christians know that's the truth. You know, if the Lord's name isn't the Lord, then tell the truth. If the commandments aren't done away with, then don't teach that they are. Teach the truth about Christmas. Teach the truth about Easter. You know, let the truth reign. And then the truth will set you free from bondage and sin and all the crap that has come along with years of pagan Christianity and casually letting uh, all the worldly and pagan observances come into your life. That's all I gotta say. On Peter Youngren, I wish the best to him and his family and all his endeavors. And uh, I pray that we all repent, not just him, but I repent. And that uh, everybody who watches this truly repents and turns from whatever they know to be doing is wrong and starts leading a, a better life, a more aware life. And if any of you out there want to pray for me, you know, my 30th birthday is coming up and I'm going through some personal challenges. It's like I'm going to quit drinking coffee. I'm going to quit drinking tea. I'm going to radically get more healthy and start exercising and change my life. And I want to do better and do greater things. So this is the first time I've ever asked. But if people out there are praying people and would like to pray for me, uh, I would welcome it. And uh, I welcome all your prayers and all your well wishes. And I want the truth. That's the bottom line. I'm not, I'm not hiding in a dark place and telling people that they can't look at my life. I'm saying, whatever the truth is, let's go with that. And the truth is, this video is over. Take care. Thanks for watching the Adam Joshua World Broad.